All right, 11 o'clock makes it official, folks. So thank you all for dropping in today. Uh, and today's subject of our History at Home lesson um, is Brigadier General Micah Jenkins. A uh, fascinating guy. I, I guess we could almost say we're doing this just a little bit backwards in that in recent weeks, uh, we've had uh, a lesson uh, or two mentioning the Spanish-American War in 1898. So the name Micah Jenkins has already come up, but it's come up in the context of a later conflict and a later generation of the same family. So let's run backwards a little bit to the Micah Jenkins whose name is better known. Uh, and you see here an image of this uh, handsome and promising young officer. Uh, his background was from Edisto Island. That's where he was actually born. Uh, in fact, one of his nicknames was the Prince of Edisto. And he was born into a prosperous family. Uh, he grew up on Edisto Island. He grew up riding um, uh, thoroughbred horses. Uh, he grew up hunting extensively, uh, sailing and crabbing. These were his activities at home uh, when spending the months in Charleston that the family spent would be the time he got most of his formal instruction, particularly in education in the classics, uh, but as well, dancing and fencing lessons. Uh, and this was the kind of thing in which the young man excelled. He also had a very religious upbringing uh, and one that was very focused on patriotism as well. Uh, although his father had not seen combat in the War of 1812, that hadn't been his own fault. His father had been very anxious to see action when he became an officer for that war. Uh, and his grandfather, of course, was a revolutionary veteran. And Jenkins was raised to a strong sense of duty he was also raised to some powerful religious scruples. And uh, one of the early stories that comes to us about his childhood has to do with one of those fishing adventures. Um, apparently about age 12, he managed to lodge a large fish hook in his wrist. And apparently this, this wasn't just a prick, he couldn't handle it himself, they couldn't pull it out, and they literally had to take him to the doctor, to a surgeon. And the surgeon was going to have to, the surgeon was going to have to cut into the 12 year old boy's wrist in order to get that fish hook out. So wow, it must have been lodged in there, something awful, I wince to think about it. And the surgeon getting ready to pull it out, uh, he pulled out the medicinal whiskey and told the boy to drink some of this whiskey to dull the pain. And little Micah firmly refused to take that whiskey. Uh, he said he had promised his mother. He had promised his mother that he would never take a sip of an intoxicating liquor. And there was no medicinal exception in his 12 year old mind. Uh, and so although he apparently fainted from the pain as the hook was removed, he didn't compromise his principles. So a very strong-minded young man. And it would be only three years later in 1851 that he would enter the Citadel. Now the Citadel, of course, is a prestigious undergraduate college today. And the people that we see entering there have graduated from high school. So, you know, uh, I don't know what the minimum admission age is uh, by formal 
requirements, but we see 18, 19, 20 year old freshmen. Uh, Micah Jenkins was 15 years old at the time of his entrance into the Citadel. And that strong mindedness that had demonstrated itself in dealing with the fish hook. Well, apparently, Micah, um, the person who would today at the Citadel have been considered his senior mentor, I referred to an early memory of the young man uh, right at the time of admission. He was standing by the Sally Port door. Uh, actually, that's redundant. The Sally Port is a door, but he was standing by the Sally Port at the Citadel. And apparently, John P. Thomas relates, it was, as I remember, the day he enrolled that he stated to me, as we stood together near the Sally Port at the Citadel, that he intended to be first in his class. Uh, and this was written years later in Reminiscences and a Celebration of Jenkins' Life. So uh, Thomas qualified the statement there. He made sure he didn't want it to be looked at as uh, uh, being arrogant. He said this he stated not arrogantly, but resolutely. Well, to venture a little bit into personal opinion, the Venn diagram of resolute and arrogant might overlap a little bit. And Micah was aggressive in his pursuit of any goal that he picked, including leadership goals. Uh, so later on in his army career, he would strike some fellow officers as arrogant. Uh, and sometimes he would have um, rather uh, thorny relations with peers. With subordinates, he was always looked up to as a leader. And he always garnered the praise of those who commanded him. Uh, and if you look at the person who always gets a great fitness report, uh, we could almost forecast that from his performance at the Citadel. This was not a light or a, um, uh, this was not a whimsical thing that he said about being first in the class and then just happened to be first in the class four years later. Uh, rather, he dedicated himself to this goal. And one way we see that he dedicated this himself to this goal is um, how dismayed he was when it looked for a while as if he might not be in the running for first cadet anymore. Uh, we all have the picture of life at a military school from uh, contemporary ideas. Uh, people who attend the Citadel or one of the military academies or a similar school today. Some of that is parallel. Some things were very different. Uh, remember that entering at 15, most of Jenkins' time at the Citadel would really overlap what we would consider high school and not college years. The fourth classmen were instructed in math, geometry, English, state history, South Carolina state history, patriotism, and your focus and your identity was very local, state history during your freshman year. And the school of the duties of the private, you learned to be a common soldier in your first year. The second year, you moved on and began a foreign language, French, American history, now that you were well-versed in state history, was a formal approach to American history. And on the military side, you learned up to the duties of the corporal. In the third year, the duties of the sergeant, as you tackled more French, trigonometry, rhetoric, philosophy, modern history, and the school of artillery drill. So each cadet who was a junior, by the time he was done with the junior class, uh, he would be skilled in the artillery, as well as the infantry that he'd had three years of at this point. And during their last year, they tackled military and civil engineering, as well as chemistry and law and the duties of a commissioned officer. 
Well, there was a bit of a kerfuffle during his Citadel years. Uh, in the spring of 1853, Jenkins apparently considered leaving. And he considered leaving because it was possible that he wasn't going to be in the running anymore for first in his class. And this was so important to him uh, that it, it caused a personal crisis. Uh, apparently what had happened was a fight. Uh, there was a brawl between some cadets, uh, which seems to have included Jenkins, and uh, some Charleston uh, young men of about the same age, that, that age-old rivalry that happens between people who are attending an exclusive college and people their own age in the local area who aren't attending that college. Somehow it turned into a big fight. And the school's response to this infraction of discipline was, was quite severe. Uh, the cadets, including Jenkins, were all confined to the campus and they all received uh, a serious penalty in demerits. Um, Jenkins thought this was not fair, but the worst part to him was not the unfairness of the decision. If you've been in military college for three years, you have learned, okay, sometimes there's bad decisions that you just have to deal with or decisions that in your youthful mind you disagree with um, that just have to be dealt with. But the number of demerits, he believed it was so large that there was no way he could be ranked first in his class anymore. And so this caused a personal crisis. Now, like Congress over nullification, the, the Citadel administration backed down. Perhaps they looked into the case further uh, or realized in their early response they'd overreacted. The punishment was kept except for the demerits. After review, the demerits were rescinded and Jenkins completed his years at the Citadel and would indeed graduate first in his class. But we see how goal-driven he was um, by how strongly he took the possibility that, hey, I'm, if I'm not going to graduate first in the class, maybe, maybe it's not worth it. Um, another great story, and by the way, I'm relying on a couple of books today as well as museum sources, but this Prince of Edisto by James K. Swisher. Swisher. Uh, Prince of Edisto is definitely a book you want to try to locate at your library uh, if you want to dig deeper into the career of this really interesting man. Uh, you can also find, I believe through the Citadel itself, reprints of uh, a pamphlet sized item. the career and character of General Micah Jenkins. Career and character can be found separately, as well as this volume, which combines that pamphlet with some other sources, um, General Brigadier General Jenkins and the Palmetto Sharpshooters. Uh, so one of the stories related from his cadet days, now remember how strong, uh, how strongly he had been conditioned against the use of alcohol, but there was another vice that he fell into. Uh, and this is a story from Asbury Coward, whose name comes up a great deal in the Micah Jenkins story. During the first two years of his cadet life, he had fallen into the senseless habit of freely using profane expressions in his conversations. Uh, he went off to the Citadel and learned to cuss. Now, what that cussing sounded like, um, I, it would have been different from what we think of as using profane expressions today, perhaps. Uh, for instance, uh, Wade Hampton occasionally said infernal, but felt really bad about it afterwards because that was a profane expression. So what form the profane expressions took and whether those same words would bother us today is uh, open to conjecture. However, they bothered Jenkins. He recognized they were a bad habit 
and Asbury Coward writes, a companion, not free himself from the same habit, undertook to lecture him. The result was a banter from Jenkins that both should drop the habit from that moment, with the understanding that the first to lapse should turn his back and let the other strike him with utmost force between the shoulders. So next, next one of us to cuss, the other one can you know, punch him in the spine. Well, it's a tough habit. It, it's, a, it's a tough habit to consciously restrain when you're talking in conversation uh, for a young man who's become accustomed to using certain expressions. In less than five minutes, Jenkins incurred the penalty. The blow was given with vigor and received with good faith. And for both of them, the habit was broken for life. From that day on, no one heard a profane expression fall from his lips. From that day, with him, began in earnest the discipline of self-control. The Citadel at that time was not a college that uh, you know, today, half the graduates more or less are commissioned into one of the United States Armed Forces. Uh, that was neither the case, nor was it the purpose of the college at the time that Micah Jenkins was attending. Uh, it, there was a National Military Academy, but this place was designed for the education of South Carolina citizens. In fact, the legislature had actually passed a law at that point uh, that said that only South Carolinians may attend the Citadel. And upon graduation, they were expected to go into leading positions in the, the civil structure of the state in one way or another. And that all of these lawyers and planters and uh, businessmen and other folks in the state would have the training as military officers as part of the permanent militia structure. So it was essentially like a, a National Guard college uh, in that in time of war, all of these leaders of society would also be qualified leaders for any military effort, not as their career, but uh, simply as part of their leadership duty. So Micah graduates first in his class, too much fanfare, uh, and is only 19 years old. Now, at this point, he undertakes uh, I, um, a project much in keeping, I think, with the purposes of the Citadel, but causing a little bit of dismay. We're gonna skip forward here a little bit. Uh, here is a slightly later picture of Jenkins and then over to Jenkins' left, your right and mine, is his best friend from the Citadel, the man whose quotes we just read. That fellow's name is Asbury Coward. Now, apparently, during their time at the Citadel, um, a couple of the officers on the faculty there at the Citadel had discussed with a group of cadets the possibility of starting another military school. Several were involved in the project at the beginning, but dropped away as they came up with other purposes. Uh, they found other directions in life that were more attractive. But Micah Jenkins and Asbury Coward, uh, firm friends throughout their lives, uh, a real Damon and Pythias pair of close friends, and they determined that they were going to start a military school in the upper part of the state, uh, Kings Mountain Military Academy, uh, and Kings Mountain Military College. And Kings Mountain Military College was going to be founded by two 19-year-old brand new graduates leaving the Citadel. Uh, so it's quite an ambitious plan. And in order to um, get some support for this, uh, Jenkins is, is the one of the two who is better at networking uh, and, you know, garnering support. He's a very, very persuasive young man. 
uh, Asbury Coward would uh, say later about their friendship, he would remark that they were very different people from one another, that their gifts really sort of complemented each other. And Jenkins was the one out of the two that was, was good at dealing with the higher authorities and getting the support of the kind of people who could help. So in their project of starting this new military school, um, Jenkins decided to solicit the support of General Jameson, a planter uh, and a, a very prominent man politically, um, a man in fact who just a couple of years later is going to be the guy who's uh, actually the president of the secession convention. And Jenkins goes to visit his place uh, and in the course of visiting his place to try to get support for his new military college scheme. He meets Jenkins, or, uh, he meets Jameson's 16 year old daughter, Caroline. So one of them is 19, one of them is uh, 16 and the two young people immediately uh, fall deeply in love with each other. Now, Caroline, or Carrie Jenkins, uh, Carrie had very much been a daddy's girl. Uh, in fact, she would write later that my father educated me from my 10th year, uh, and how much time she spent in his company over the years between when she was 10 uh, and when she, she got married. Uh, Caroline was, uh, I would say, extremely homeschooled, according to her account. Caroline said, my girlhood was spent almost entirely in his library. And Caroline uh, mastered French and Latin and uh, adored her father. And her father did not at first adore Micah Jenkins in the least. Uh, her father was impressed by the young man's ambition and his intention to have this military school. On the other hand, education uh, was not a field that he thought a young man would prosper in. Uh, he did think that his 16 year old daughter was too young and that the 19 year old brand new graduate was too young to be undertaking such an important decision. And there was a serious religious difference between the two as well. Jenkins was very pious and serious as we've seen about his faith, but he was also a high church Episcopalian. Now the, um, uh, his intended bride's family, they were all very serious Presbyterians. Uh, and so Caroline and her family, uh, now we are not used to Protestant denominations uh, feeling that uh, opposed or a level of antagonism perhaps uh, as was going on there, but they were a century and a half closer to the times when the Anglicans, uh, or the Episcopalians original name, uh, and the Presbyterians had actually fought armed struggles uh, during the 1600s and had often taken the opposite side from each other in the American Revolution. They had differences on theological questions. And so they really felt like this, the differences in the faith, the two young people didn't see as such a problem, but the families kind of did. Um, Micah's sister, Elizabeth, advised him, do not, my brother, make any promises about yourself, although you may promise not to interfere with her. I have seen a great deal of harm come out of such promises, very easily made. But when it comes to quitting your father's church, it is not so easy. Um, Jameson, as well, 
uh, Jameson, this is Caroline's father, wrote that he was young in years and could educate himself to any point he might wish. And there were many roads a determined mind might follow, but education was a noble employment. It would suffice to say when one's life was almost done, I have done my duty. Well, eventually, Kings Mountain Military Academy is founded, does begin to be a success. And uh, from that quote there, you can see that Caroline's father does come around to the idea that what Jenkins apparently intends to do with his life, which is run this military school, is a, is a worthy enough prospect. And the young man apparently won him over. The military school would begin to prosper too. A pivotal moment for Kings Mountain Military Academy would be in 1855 when the battle that it was named for, the Battle of Kings Mountain, uh, they were holding a huge commemoration of the battle. You could almost say a, a reenactment, although they didn't try to get period uniforms to do it. They did bring in the cadet corps of the Citadel in order to illustrate things about this battle. And Micah Jenkins worked his connections and brought his young uh, cadets, his high school aged cadets, to be part of this big event uh, also. And that brought really good statewide publicity for the good things he was doing with young men in the upcountry. Uh, it showed that they were not a rival, but cooperating with his uh, alma mater at the Citadel. And it began a rise in the fortunes of Kings Mountain Military Academy, uh, Military College, both in um, finances, but also in prestige. And Micah and Caroline were married. Their preacher at the marriage, it shows who is winning the theology battle. Um, in 1856, the two of them are married and the wedding is officiated, uh, officiated over by Dr. Benjamin Palmer, who is one of the leading Presbyterian lights of the the 19th century. So apparently uh, it is Caroline who is winning the uh, balance of power there, religiously speaking. Although we're gonna see themes even in the letters between the two of them later on that show it, it stayed a matter of discussion. Well, Micah Jenkins is of course caught up in the str struggle of the 1860s. Uh, in fact, he will be commissioned directly as a colonel in May of 1861, uh, or actually in May of 1861, things are still uh, developing as to how the army is gonna work. So he's, to be technical, he is elected the colonel of the 5th Regiment to go off to war. Uh, we don't see a lot of commentary from Micah Jenkins about his political feelings during the buildup to the war itself. Um, but we do know that he was an extremely effective leader with the 5th Regiment. And the 5th Regiment, the 4th and the 9th, at the reorganization of the Confederate Army, uh, that occurs later. Those regiments, their time that they originally enlisted for has run out. And so what's going to happen in the reorganization of the army is some of them will choose to re-enlist. And from a group that is re-enlisting from those four regiments, the 4th, 5th, and the 9th, uh, in April of 1862, a new regiment will be formed and this outfit will be under Colonel Micah Jenkins, formerly of the 5th, and this regiment will be called the Palmetto Sharpshooters. The Palmetto Sharpshooters is envisioned as a unit that is gonna be of specialized skirmishers, specialized riflemen. Um, that is not actually how they're gonna wind up being employed. And sharpshooter is a job 
in the 1860s that's sort of in flux. Uh, the modern idea of a specialized sniper corps has not really come into play yet, but they are familiar with how riflemen were used as sharpshooters in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and of course, uh, this man literally runs the military school that's called King's Mountain Military College. And King's Mountain in the American Revolution is a great triumph of the American riflemen using more sharpshooting tactics against regular infantry of the British. But the Palmetto sharpshooters might be, oh wow, isn't it great when you see a misspelling in your own presentation when it's too late? That was a great typo to make. It should say Colonel, of course. Um, they're not usually going to be employed as sharpshooters. Instead, uh, the Palmetto sharpshooters will be employed as elite infantry and will perform very well in one engagement after another. They're a very distinguished unit. Uh, but the one I'm gonna dig into a little bit today is the fight at Fraser's Farm. Uh, because this is the one from which we have a couple of artifacts uh, at the museum that are, are one artifact in particular that's startlingly dramatic. But also the more I've dug into the story, the more interesting the whole thing becomes. This was part of the Seven Days Battles around Richmond in 1862, and a very costly day for the South Carolina unit, and a story of a military misunderstanding. So let's look at that map from the Battle of Fraser's Farm, also referred to as the Battle of Glendale. And if you look toward the Confederate center here, whoop, hold on. Hopefully y'all can see my um, laser pointer here. You see Jenkins right there. And by the time of this battle, Jenkins with superior performance uh, in a lot of engagements, he has risen to brigade command. So the Palmetto sharpshooters are at this point one of the regiments that are under his command, uh, but he's actually in command of all of these South Carolina regiments as a brigade. And one account says that Brigadier General Jenkins was so promising that General Robert E. Lee at one point had uh, stopped his horse and said where other men could hear, um, you're doing a great job, Brigadier General Jenkins, and I hope to see you as one of my Lieutenant Generals one day. Uh, so that's, um, that's strong praise from a powerful source and it shows what a promising officer Micah Jenkins was considered to be. But this day at Fraser's Farm, look here and you'll see some batteries. Can you see those are little tiny cannon shapes here? And these batteries, the battle hasn't seriously opened, but the batteries are in a position to harass and fire upon the Confederate Army. And apparently the instructions that Longstreet, General Longstreet gave to Micah Jenkins were misunderstood. Longstreet intended that the sharpshooters should be used as sharpshooters often were. He sent word to Jenkins that, um, well, what he wanted to have happen was to have the sharpshooters suppress those cannons. He wanted to move them up as skirmishers and use the sharpshooters to cut down uh, the artillery. And this is from Longstreet's own writings. While awaiting the approach of Jackson, 
President Davis, General Lee, APO, and his staff joined me in a little clearing of about three acres curtained by the dense pine forest. We were disturbed by a few shells tearing and screaming through the woods over our heads, one or two bursting in our midst and wounding a courier. The opening was speedily cleared of the distinguished group. Near the battery from which the shots came was Colonel Micah Jenkins, who had a battalion of practiced sharpshooters. I sent orders for Jenkins to silence the battery under the uh, impression that the sharpshooters we pushed forward till they could pick off the gunners, thus ridding us of the annoyance. But Jenkins, getting the word silence the battery, did not think, oh, he means I should send one part of my unit to suppress the fire of the artillery. Instead, as Longstreet Street writes, the gallant Jenkins, only too anxious for a dash at the battery, charged and captured it and thus precipitated the battle. So he advances to the edge of the woods and making his men lie down, Colonel Jenkins sent his aide to General Longstreet to report. Instead of a battery, it was at least a brigade entrenched. He thought it was a division. Unable to find Longstreet, Lieutenant Jameson reported to Colonel Fairfax, his chief of staff. Fairfax replied, Longstreet ordered that battery silenced. So through this series of misunderstandings, oh, we'll all take forward and take the battery. Wait a minute, it's not a battery. There's a whole army back there. Let's send word. And word comes not from Longstreet himself, but from his chief of staff, who maybe doesn't process the information correctly, Longstreet ordered that battery silenced. And so they moved forward. This reminded more than one observer who learned about the history afterwards of the famous charge of the light brigade at Balaclava where a group of cavalry uh, received mistaken orders to charge an artillery position and took terrible losses in doing so. Uh, I have heard what follows, mainly from the lips of the gallant Jameson, writes Longstreet, who in that very fight was to get the terrible wound that made him a martyr to his death. Reporting to Colonel Jenkins, the order of Colonel Fairfax, I heard him say as if in prayer, my God, my poor men. Riding out in front of the regiment, my father told my mother, I was never so nearly unmanned. Every eye was upon me. I knew at my word, so many, so many of my brave boys at the setting of the sun would be sleeping their last long sleep. Riding up and down in front of his men, he led them across the field. Within 50 yards, his first horse was killed. Staggering like a ship at sea, beating against the wind, they worked their arduous way. Incessant was the roar, unceasing was the storm of shot and shell. Terrible was the cry of the file closers, close up, close up, as by ones and twos and fives and tens, the gaps were made. Enfiladed at 300 yards by 12 pieces of artillery firing grape and shell, still they pressed on, death and red carnage held full sway. This was the fight at which the legendary artifact held by the relic room, the one that uh, was the focus of a um, Mysteries at the Museum episode some years ago was created. Uh, and that is the so-called Sword of Prophecy of Micah Jenkins. Oh, we're getting ahead a little bit, but you can actually see the Sword of Prophecy over here in this case. So. I'll leave it there. Um, the sword has actually been shot off. Part of it has been lost as well as the scabbard, both part of it shot off and additional pieces of damage wreaked upon it by shrapnel. And how that happened that day at Fraser's farm uh, is described in a letter written July 3rd uh, from Micah to Caroline. My own dearest, he begins, I write with the most saddened feelings. God has been most merciful, but oh my God, what terrible trials have we been through. Nearly all my best friends, men and officers, killed and wounded. 
In my regiment, in the fight on Monday, I carried 375 men and had 250 killed and wounded. Never was such gallantry shown. I had the brigade and was ordered forward by Generals Anderson and Longstreet. The enemy behind breastworks poured their fire into us until within 30 feet before they gave back. And 12 pieces of artillery for a quarter of a mile enfiladed my line at 300 yards with grape and shell. We drove everything before us, but when we got there, scarce anybody left. Even the Yankee officers, the colonel commanding the brigade said, never was such a charge made before. I have not time to write you more now. Poor John, shot through the lungs. I pray God he may recover. I am the most singular incidence of the providence of God. My sword shot off with a grape, broken again by a ball. The sword knot cut by a ball. My bridle rein cut with a ball. My saddle cloth cut with a ball. My horse shot under me twice. My overcoat tied behind my saddle cut in a dozen places with a shell. I hit upon the shoulder with a grape and upon the breast with a shell. I'm here to praise and bless him. If I live, my wife, my life is his hereafter. I dedicate it to his service. May God bless and keep you. I have not time to write more. Yours till death, Micah Jenkins. And when Jenkins says here in the story of this fight uh, that even the federal colonel had something to say, General McCall, the federal commander that day, says, um, and this is not the same one he's referring to apparently, but General McCall, the federal commander says, it was my fortune to witness one of the fiercest bayonet charges that ever occurred on this continent. I saw skulls smashed with musket butts and bayonet wounds given and taken, thus proving that Greek met Greek. Their comrades, right and left, enthused to the highest pitch, rushed in with the same spirit and thus was the battle joined. Never was a more heroic and devoted band than the color bearers. F.W. Poe of Greenville, after five or six were slain, bore the colors so proudly as to excite the admiration of his colonel. Alas, he bore it on to death. So that's uh, uh, the last bits there that I've quoted you uh, were passed down to us through Robert Jenkins, who researched the career of his father uh, in order to write a memorial. Now, there's so much more of a career of battles that we could tackle because uh, Jenkins' brigade uh, is going to fight in many of the biggest battles of the Army of Northern Virginia and is actually going to be transferred at one point to fight in Tennessee and then back to the Army of Northern Virginia. So a, um, a lot of military action should be covered, but we have limited time and I've referred you to some good books. Uh, I do have another letter here I didn't want to leave out. This is something that Jenkins sent to his wife in May 28th, on uh, May 28th of 1862. My beloved wife, I got a letter five days old today. I think he's praising the mail service that it took only five days. And was happy to hear from you again. I am now in the hands of my God, and I entrust you and my dear children to his faith fatherly keeping. The great battle is very, very near, I think. And uh, the soldiers often believed, told themselves, I think perhaps hoped that a single climactic battle was approaching and whatever battle it was would end everything. Uh, that is, was of course a futile hope so early in 1862. I trust our prayers may be favorably considered by our God and his hand will cover and protect me so when this unhappy war is over, I may live to be a husband to you and a father to my children. Two years later at the wilderness, that great climactic battle has not yet come. Uh, the issue is still in doubt. The armies are still struggling back and forth. And the story had been told throughout the army regarding that broken sword. You heard what 
Jenkins wrote to his wife about that incident and how he felt on that terrible day and with the awful losses that he had suffered at Fraser's farm. Well, it seems at some point that he made a remark that was less serious and, and more in the line of a certain black humor. And that was his broken sword that he referred to. Apparently at some point, and we don't have a firm time and place that this quote happened, Micah Jenkins uh, referred to the way he'd lost two horses that day and the other problems that he'd had. And when he told his wife he, he, that he had two wounds, he was, uh, that he'd been struck twice, that is, uh, in the shoulder by a grape, which caused a minor wound, and in the breast by a shell, which must have been a spent bit of shrapnel that did no serious damage at all. Uh, but apparently he said, something along the lines of today has proved that I cannot be killed by a Yankee bullet. If it could have happened, it would have happened today. That was the way the story went around the army. And the reason that the sword on display here acquired the nickname, the Sword of Prophecy. At the wilderness, Jenkins uh, still part of Longstreet's command group, was riding with Longstreet and a group of officers. And uh, something happened that many called almost a replay of what had happened to Stonewall Jackson. And that was that this group of officers riding towards the front, and you will not normally find a group of senior officers toward the front of a fight in quite this Fashion. Apparently, they were riding forward to find out exactly what was going on to make good decisions on that confused battlefield. And they came upon uh, some soldiers who had just captured a federal position and, in fact, had captured uh, a United States flag. And excitedly, one of these soldiers approached the group with the enemy banner that he had just captured. And, you know, he was showing it off to the officers and a group of Confederate troops approaching saw a group of mounted men and a federal flag. And they reacted quickly. Uh, it was apparently a federal group of officers or a group of Union cavalry. They could see the flag and a group of mounted men. So they leveled their muskets and fired a volley. And it was a volley that wounded Longstreet and took him out of action at what might have been a critical time for the battle. But it was the volley that killed Micah Jenkins uh, while he was actually wearing this particular coat that's also on display at our museum. So a tragic friendly fire incident and friendly fire incidents uh, in the 1860s could be, you know, they, they could be quite common because senior officers, to do a good job, sometimes had to do their own reconnaissance. They had to ride their horses out toward or even uh, in front of the advance of the army. And if you ride out from the army, you also have to ride back towards it at some point and it can be e very easy to have mistaken identity. Uh, similar mistaken identity almost happened to uh, some of the South Carolina troops when they were transferred to the West and were approaching the Confederate Army of the Tennessee, members of Kershaw's brigade, because their gray uniforms were English army cloth, which looked rather dark compared to many other uniforms, uh, were mistaken for blue and fired on, uh, although not with casualties in that incidence. But these mistakes were terribly easy to make on the battlefield. Well, Jenkins was struck in the head. It was uh, certainly going to be a fatal wound, they could tell that, but he lingered for some hours uh, and said a few things, and they were not things that were lit related to what was going on around him. Apparently, he couldn't perceive what was going on anymore. Uh, in fact, Dr. Parker, the surgeon, remarked, the general lived six hours, breathing his last a little after 6 p.m. He was semi-conscious. Without recognizing our voices, I think he knew we were with him. He died confident of victory. And at the last moment when his gallant spirit took its upward flight, 
A bright, happy, trusting smile lit up his face. Those around watched him. We thought, we felt, he was with his God. Personally, Mrs. Jenkins, I feel that I have lost a very, very warm friend. We all feel so. All words of mine would be inadequate to express how totally devoted he was to you and to his little boys. Micah Jenkins had four little boys at home. And here we see his memorial in Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston uh, with the engraved unbroken sword on it. Well, those four boys at home, uh, his best friend Asbury Coward does survive the war. And Colonel Coward, almost unbelievably, uh, with tremendous determination, he opens again the Kings Mountain Military School just a year after the war in 1866. Uh, the Citadel is not going to reopen for many years after that. But Kings Mountain Military College, he reopens. And all of Micah Jenkins' uh, four surviving sons, they had one who died in childbirth, but uh, his four surviving sons are all going to be graduates of the Kings Mountain Military School. And some of them go on to other military colleges, uh, two of them, in fact, graduating from West Point. So Asbury Coward uh, works to raise and educate the sons of his good friend, Micah Jenkins. Coward will go on uh, in 1890 to actually become the superintendent of the Citadel. And two of Jenkins' sons will have distinguished military careers of their own. Uh, one of these young men, Micah Jenkins, Jr. We talked about him during the Spanish-American War. And Micah Jenkins, Jr. winds up graduating from West Point in the 1880s and commanding a company of um, Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders at San Juan Hill, where he is promoted to major for gallantry in action. Well, his brother, John M. Jenkins, another West Point graduate, is going to be a career soldier in the U.S. Army, uh, earn the Distinguished Service Cross in the First World War, and rise to Brigadier General himself. And John Jenkins, Jr., his son, will have a similar Army career. Both of them are buried in the United States um, National Military Cemetery at Arlington. Now, when you come by the museum, which I hope is going to be a practical option again before very long, that's where some of Jenkins' legacy, uh, his material culture legacy, his physical legacy, has been able to be carried out, uh, preserved. Um, one thing that you will see in the background of the case that I showed earlier here, right here, behind his coat is all that is left of the original silk banner of the Palmetto Sharpshooters. And when that item was uh, donated to the Relic Room uh, early in the 20th century, uh, I believe by the Reunion Association of the Palmetto Sharpshooters, that's the kind of condition it was already in. Uh, apparently it had been kept in a safe deposit box. Uh, but there is also an account um, from a Confederate veteran referring to how some of these flags were treated at reunions, and they had more of the relic than the artifact mentality, to say the least, with these flags. Of one of the flags in the collection, a veteran would write that at their annu annual reunion, we called our children forward that they might finger the sacred folds of the flag. Well, if there's a better way to destroy a piece of historic 
silk than to have children finger it decades after its construction. I can't think of it. So flags like that of the Palmetto sharpshooters often disappeared entirely, but this one didn't. A few pieces of tattered silk were preserved reverently and donated to the relic room. And the two most intact pieces were this um, battle honor from Seven Pines and the other battle honor from Williamsburg, both of them part of the Seven Days Campaign, uh, the campaign in which Fraser's farm also occurred and in which the sword on display underneath them was broken. You can come in also and see Micah Jenkins' coat um, with its palmetto South Carolina buttons on them, so similar to those worn by cadets at the Citadel today, where Jenkins Hall, uh, which is sort of the headquarters building, more or less, of the Citadel, is named in honor of this honored graduate of that institution. So folks, that was an introduction and a few references of things you could follow up on to the career of this uh, education leader and this uh, important military leader of South Carolina. Uh, and as always, I'm interested in historical connections and how uh, his family believed they ought to carry out his legacy. Uh, and they did so by serving in the United States military, while his best friend not only carried out for a while the school that they had founded together, but then moved back into the Citadel that they had attended together and became a pivotal and really important figure in the history of that institution, surviving and continuing its legacy. So thank you all today. I know that um, all that can be done in a short, session like this with a few pictures is to to pique your interest. Uh, again, Prince of Edisto by James K. Swisher. Uh, that's a terrific book if you want to go further with Micah Jenkins. Uh, you can look for Gen Mike, General Micah Jenkins and the Palmetto Sharpshooters in the South Carolina Regimental series, as well as the small volume, Career and Character of General Micah Jenkins, CSA. I believe that that uh, has been republished as a small pamphlet through the Citadel. And any book I fail to endorse here, that's not a non-endorsement. If you can find other things about Micah Jenkins, uh, The Struck Eagle is a book you'll want to dig into. And if you find any others I didn't mention, please tell me about them uh, so that I can dig into. Um, any questions in our last minute or so? Thank you all very much for attending, deciding to spend some time with a little history talk this morning uh, and be watching on Monday for next week's topics, probably the last quarantine live streams that we'll do, although uh, not the last live streams. Thank you all very much. Um, Mr. Long? Yes? Um, w did they take an artillery battery when Micah Jenkins was shot? Yeah, they did. Artillery battery flag? Yes, they did. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm confusing the two incidents. I do not know what kind of flag they were... Um, they had just captured at the wilderness. Uh, that wasn't Jenkins' own men that had done that in any case, but an artillery battery guide on probably wouldn't have caused the same kind of confusion. So I'm gonna guess it was probably an infantry flag that had been captured there, but that is just a guess. You'll wanna look it up. I thought you were talking about Fraser's farm where they actually did take artillery and uh, it's, it's worth bringing up that while the honor of an infantry unit, um, in a sense, resided in its flag, to capture the flag of an enemy unit or, or to preserve your own flag were um, 
really involved with the regimental honor. In an artillery battery, the, the parallel thing, the significant thing was the guns themselves. Uh, an artillery captain, an artillery officer is going to say that he will not lose his guns, that the guns have to be preserved at all cost. The symbol of an infantry regiment being completely destroyed and routed is if they leave their flag behind. If they've left their flag behind, that's, that's a terrible disgrace. Uh, for an artillery battery, it's the guns being overrun and captured, which constitutes the same kind of thing. Uh, so the artillery, uh, artillery guidon bearer was not a particularly dangerous job in the 1860s. Uh, infantry, uh, the, the flag bearer is of course one of the most dangerous jobs on the battlefield. Uh, so thanks for a, a question that was an excuse to make that remark. Uh, but I don't have an answer for you on what kind of flag had been captured. The incident's been studied, so I'm sure it's in one of the books, but not one of the ones I looked at to get ready for this presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Anybody else out there? Have a terrific lunch and a wonderful weekend. Thank you all very much.